Well, thank you for joining us today, Mayor. We have a number of questions we want to get to with you. And I want to start with the big mask debate. So right now, the city of Savannah is the only Georgia city with a mask requirement. Do you plan to issue a mask mandate for the city of Atlanta? Well, it's something that we are in discussions about. And what I know is this, that with or without um, a, something mandating that people wear masks, people should still wear masks. Mm -hmm. And it is really the most unselfish thing that you can do as it relates to COVID-19. It not only protects yourself, um, but the people around you. And when I'm looking at numbers with COVID-19, that are very alarming. Um, I haven't seen numbers this high in a very long time. And this is something that people should take seriously. And so we'll continue to watch what happens mm -hmm. in Savannah and then make our decisions accordingly. Is it something you are thinking about? It is something I am thinking about, yes. Okay. Um, I saw your tweet the other day. You said that you're a realist and not an alarmist, but we have never seen numbers like this before since the pandemic in Georgia. Yeah, it's, it's very concerning. And I receive a daily update from our team and it shows um, the seven day period data and how high the numbers are ticking up. And there was a point in time when our numbers had gotten down as low as 8% um, over a week's time they're now over 20%. And so I, I think, again, we have to take responsibility for ourselves, but also think about the people who are around us who are vulnerable. We know that COVID-19 is making healthy people very, very sick, but also think about our children and think about our seniors and people with compromised immune systems and even people with underlying health conditions. And these are very common conditions in our city, asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes. A lot of people don't even know that they suffer from these things, but if they are infected with COVID-19, it could prove deadly. Do you think the governor should mandate everyone wear masks? I think it would be helpful if we had some consistency throughout the state, but the reality is this, even with a mandate, um, if people don't take it seriously, then it, it's going to be very difficult for us to enforce. But I do think any type of consistent messaging that we can have coming from the governor's office is helpful. I'm very encouraged that he's going around the state encouraging people to wear a mask. And, and we'll see if it's um, helpful in Savannah in terms of um, their, their numbers and rate of infection. And whether it's enforceable as well. So we saw the governor out with the U.S. Surgeon General today putting that message out for everyone to wear masks. What do you think is to blame for the surge of infections here in Georgia? Well, my understanding and talking with our healthcare professionals, they're a combination of things. One, the reopening certainly did not help us with our numbers. And then we had so many um, mass gatherings over the past few weeks. And so I, I think it has, has been um, a, a perfect, um, unfortunate storm in terms of opening up suddenly and then adding on top of that mass gatherings. Um, and so I think, I, I don't know that the experts know definitively um, which caused what, but what we do know is where we are today and our infection rates um, are going through the roof. Do you think we opened up too fast? I do. I, I've always said that I, I thought we needed to be a, a little more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen and that it should have been a much more phased approach and also an opportunity for us to do more contact tracing. When we look at where the numbers are lower in the country, it is in the Northeast where they were a bit slower to reopen. But um, we are where we are now. We have to deal with what's in front of us today. And what's in front of us is that we have numbers that are, that are going up by the day. And we just have to continue um, to be vigilant. Yeah. And again, it's hot. So people don't want to wear masks outside. That's understandable. But if that's the case and you have the opportunity to stay inside, then we just encourage people to do that as well. So you mentioned the Northeast, I'm from the Northeast, and uh, just earlier this week, states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut mandated that uh, if Georgians come to those states, they have to 
quarantine. It's a mandatory quarantine for 14 days if they choose to visit. Do you agree with states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut making this mandate on Georgians if they want to come visit? I certainly understand because they um, have worked very hard to try and manage the outbreaks in their states. And so it's, it's understandable that they want to continue to do what they need to do to protect the residents uh, within, within their states. And I just wish that we had been a, a, a bit more thoughtful in terms of how we reopen, not just in Georgia, but really throughout the Southeast. And when you look at where our numbers are, are ticking up, they are in states that open up very early. And um, again, the, it, we can Monday morning quarterback, but for us to make a difference now, we've got to look at where we are and, and look, at, look ahead. And a huge part of that, again, is avoiding mass gatherings and wearing a mask when you are out in public and, and keeping your distance. What do you say to anyone thinking about attending a big July 4th celebration or firework celebration this weekend? Just keep your distance. Stay six feet apart and wear a mask. It, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can't do that, then just stay home. What are you planning to do this weekend? You know, every weekend that I anticipate that it will be a little quiet, um, it ends up not being a little, a little quiet. So I don't want to, to jinx our city or jinx myself. Um, we'll just take it day by day, but I, I don't have any plans. My kids are quarantine fatigued. So um, my daughter every day is pulling up websites and places that she thinks that we can go and I don't have the heart to tell her we're not going anywhere. Oh, that's so sad. My daughter's about to celebrate her 16th birthday next week. So I'm, I'm in the thick of it, trying to make sure everyone stays safe. Well, happy right. birthday to her. Ah, thank you. I'll let her know. All right, so let's turn now to morale within the Atlanta Police Department. The foundation president says morale has plummeted to an all-time low following a turbulent two weeks that we saw toward the end of May and the beginning of June. Eight officers now facing criminal charges. Five have lost their jobs. Officers say they don't feel valued. Is there anything, Mayor, that you've been able to say or do recently to boost morale and make these officers feel valued? And also, do you think that's your responsibility now? Well, I think it's unfortunate that our officers feel that way, but I think it's not just in Atlanta. I think that's happening across the country and it has. this has been trending this way for a very long time. But that being said, I understand that our officers have concerns um, about going out on the streets and, and not just the way that they feel that the public um, is treating them, but certainly um, their response to my response to what's happened in the city. That being said, I've always been committed to public safety in our city as and especially to our police officers. Um, during the first uh, couple of years of, in office, I put in place a 30% pay increase our police officers, which was the largest in the history of the city. And I don't say that um, simply to mention the monetary part of it, because that money doesn't make somebody always feel valued. But, but to remind our officers that when I didn't have the support of any police unions in the city, I still did what I thought was the right thing to do, because I believe that they deserve to be paid and I believe they deserve to have the opportunity to live in it, be able to live in our city, afford to live in our city and not have to work two to three jobs. So in the same way that I made that commitment to our officers, I just ask that they be reminded of the commitment that they made to our city when they took their oath. Nobody said that this job would be easy. It's not easy being mayor, certainly not easy being a police officer, but there's a commitment that comes with that there will be bumps in the road. There have been bumps in the road. We are mindful of that. Um, but the changes that we are making, not just for the safety of our community, but for the safety of our officers as well. And I think we'll get to the other side of this, but I think in the same way our demonstrators have to express themselves. Um, I think that our officers are taking the opportunity 
to do that as well. So do you think there's anything extra that you would, you would need to do during this unprecedented time to show those officers that they're valued? Is there anything extra that needs to happen? I think that we need to be very clear on what our expectations are and to the extent that we have failed our officers in any way with the training that we are providing our officers. I think it is our responsibility as a city to make it very clear what our rules and regulations are, what our expectations are. So we've done that with a series of uh, things that have come out of the advisory committee. We are looking forward to getting input from our officers. And one of our student activists uh, said something that I, I thought was so very important. He said, this cannot be a we versus, uh, an us versus them conversation. It has to be a we conversation and I think part of that we conversation is making sure that our police officers are at the table and, and are able to share their thoughts and concerns um, about how we transform policing in our city. Is the APD still dealing with call outs? They are not as high as they have been as is my understanding. Um, they are still high but again my understanding is this is actually happening across the country, not just with APD. And so um, it, it's not impacted our ability to respond or police our communities to the extent that there has been some impact. It's related more so having to divert resources to deal with the demonstrations that we've had throughout the city, but not necessarily the call outs during the period of the blue flu and you're saying that we're still dealing with some call outs right now shootings have been up traffic stops and drug arrests down significantly do you think this is a direct consequence of these recent cases rayshard brooks and the kids who were tased over in downtown atlanta so again i had a very in-depth conversation with interim chief brian about this and what he has said is this is actually happening across the country we are not the only city that's experiencing this. And um, again, we've had to divert officers to deal with the mass gatherings that we've had throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And so we, we recognize that um, the shootings are up. Mm -hmm. We recognize that the arrests are down, uh, but I think it's a combination of things. And in talking with Interim Chief Bryant, there are chiefs across the country who are seeing the same thing that um, public safety officers are in, in really a gray area and how they respond um, and, and what's expected of them. And so this is, it's a tough time in our country right now. Um, and it's certainly not the first time we face this in our country, mm -hmm. um, but there's really no, no handbook for this, at least in my lifetime. And so I joined mayors uh, across the country um, in really charting a path forward on, on how we navigate this transition. But I'm on text thread with mayors all across the country and we are sharing the, the same concerns and really looking toward um, meaningful solutions together. Do you think this is more of the criminals taking advantage of the call outs and police being busy with the protests? No, I think it's a combination of things. I think when you look at COVID and you look at the frustration and anxiety related to COVID, you look at the fact that there, our unemployment rates are at an all time high. Uh, there is just a, a lot of uncertainty and um, emotion in America right now. And then you layer on top of that what we've seen with the police killings and the, the mass demonstrations and then with our officers being concerned about how they should police our communities. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of things that, that unfortunately is not giving us the best results right now, but we're in a difficult time in our country's history, but we'll also get to the other side of this um, but it, it's an uncomfortable and it's a, a challenging time right now. But I believe in the same way, we're making progress in Atlanta and giving some definitive thoughts and steps on how we begin to transform policing. We, we will get to the other side of it. It's, it's gonna take some, some patience from all of us. 
Any message for residents who are just not feeling safe right now, Mayor? Um, my message to our residents is that by and large, what we're, we are seeing with the shootings and the uptick, um, these really are more isolated than they appear. Meaning we have some general understanding about what, what the, um, what these violent interactions have, have been about by and large. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just tell people continue to exercise caution as you would in, in any city in America um, and continue to be aware of your surroundings and to the extent possible, um, not put yourself in, in situations um, that, that aren't the safest of situations, meaning lock your car, um, don't walk places alone, and all of the things that we constantly remind our um, communities of. But um, again, this is happening across our country. We're not immune to it, but we certainly are aware of it. And we are redirecting and, and directing resources to address these issues as best we can. Mayor, you briefly mentioned the city's newly formed use of force council. What is next in this process here? So they have made 10 recommendations, three of which we have already um, begun to enact. One is creating a depository um, for witness footage that comes in on um, alleged police misconduct, informing people and expanding awareness of our citizens uh, review board. And um, there are 10 recommendations in total. So the next phase of this is for us to have public input over the next few weeks. And then also we're gonna get some, some input and, and feedback from some of our officers as well during this time. And then we look forward uh, in the interim of continuing to create and, and define the expectations for our officers throughout the city. And what I would just remind the public by and large, we have officers who continue to show up each and every day, uh, despite what's happening, um, this, despite uh, what they are often receiving um, when they go out in public, they're continuing to show up and continuing to do their job to protect our citizens. And I, I, I believe that will continue to happen. Um, but th this is, it's a challenging time for all of us right now. When you say the call outs are fewer now, can you give a specific percentage about how how many officers compared to maybe, I think it was probably about a week and a half ago, right? When we were at our highest level. Can you give us some sort of point of comparison between when it was really bad to this week? Well, I don't have those exact numbers, but what we saw happening a couple of weeks ago, it almost seemed as if it were a planned rolling call out that you would see certain shifts in certain zones and then they would move to another shift and, and another zone. And so it does not um, a, appear to be at the level that we were seeing, but still higher than usual, um, but not as, as massive and coordinated as we were seeing previously. When you hear APD officers quitting and going to other police departments or sheriff's offices in the Metro, and that many of those departments are trying to woo those officers, what goes through your mind? Do you think they're playing fair? Well, that's their prerogative, and APD will be transformed. Will be transformed, but APD has been through this before. I think a lot of our officers haven't been through a transformation with APD because we do have a lot of younger officers on our force. But we went through this um, when we had to transform APD after uh, incidents involving. Um, the Red Dog Unit, which was disbanded. We went through this after the Eagle Raid. And so we've been through this before and we want people working with APD who want to work for APD. And again, that's why we made the commitment that we did to APD because we don't want people who are resentful about showing up for work every day and who don't want uh, to be a part of our police force. 
Can you give us an update on former Chief Erica Shields? I know you said that she would stay in the department. I know that she was well liked within rank and file. Where is she now? How is she doing? Chief Shields is still with um, the Atlanta Police Department. And as we are looking at our transformation of APD, we are working with Chief Shields to define exactly what that role will be. But she grew up in, in APD and certainly was well respected and well regarded. Um, in the same way Chief Ryan, um, interim Chief Ryan did. He had recently retired from um, APD and I called Chief Ryan back to help lead our uh, corrections department in an interim capacity. Um, and so both of them well-respected leaders who worked together for many years. And so I anticipate that that will continue. How is the nationwide search going? We are on the front end of that process. I can tell you in talking with some search committees or I'm sorry, search firms, they have told us that this is probably the absolute worst time to do a nationwide search because there's so many departments looking for police chiefs right now. So we're all pulling from the same pool. I think it's gonna be important to give Chief Bryant the resources and the support that he needs to begin this transformation with APD because we can't wait um, for a search that could take months. Um, if it any indication in, in what's happened with our previous searches in the city. Um, so we just gotta make sure that we're making changes immediately and he has what he, he needs in place and, and we'll continue uh, to do what we need to do to improve APD. Is it important to find a new chief of police who is a person of color? That's not a criteria. I, I think it's just important for us to have a police chief um, who can lead our department and lead our department um, with expectations that we all have for the police departments across this country. And that's with a respect and regard for our communities. We saw the officer who fatally yeah. shot Rayshard Brooks be released from jail this week on a $500,000 bond. Is this the outcome you had expected this week? You know, I, I'm going to leave that to the judicial system in, in the same way that was an, a choice by the district attorney, attorney independent of my input um, in terms of how he proceeded with the charges against all of our officers. Um, and, you know, this is the, this part of the process um, rests with the judicial system and I'll just continue to focus on, on what I am able to focus on as mayor and that's just making sure we have the transformation underway that we need to have happen in our city. Which is a lot, by the way. You've been really busy. Uh, I was wondering if you were gonna roll out today, maybe your clone was gonna come out with us today because I don't know how, I don't know how you do it. You, you found yourself in many places. Um, doing countless interviews. Um, how, how many hours of sleep do you get a night, Mayor? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very thoughtful of, about sleeping more. I've had a lot of restless nights, not nearly as, as much as I should sleep. Uh, and in large part, I've tried to stay even with COVID on the same schedule I had when life was, was normal. Um, and, and that's getting up pretty early. Um, so some days are better than others. Four hours, five hours? Some nights. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours? <laughs> thank, thank goodness for good makeup. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Okay, so you are a contender to be Joe, Vi Joe Biden's vice president. Do you want the job? You know, I want Joe Biden to make the best choice that's going to help him defeat Donald Trump. And so if my name is, is called, that's a conversation I'll have at that time. But I don't get too high, I don't get too low, and I don't get too far ahead. I, I look at what's in front of me, and what's in front of me right now is making sure our city is where it needs to be. Are you still going through the vetting process? That's something you'll have to ask the Biden campaign about. I read and, and watch the stories in the same way that, that you do. Okay, so there's no one calling you up at like two in the morning to see how you'll respond as a potential VP at that time. 
Well, you know, I endorsed Joe Biden um, over a year ago now. And so I'm in constant contact with the campaign anyway, and I have been over the last year. So it's not unusual for me to speak with someone on behalf of the campaign. Yes, yeah, so you're just continuing to do your thing and what where the chips fall, they fall. Absolutely. Do you think it's important for Joe Biden to select a woman of color? I think it's important for him to select the person who's going to help him win and then help him govern because I, every, everything about America has changed. Yeah. Um, there were so many problems that we knew existed in our country and that we were focused on, but certainly not in the way that we've been focused over the past several weeks. and. I think if you talk with anyone who went through the civil rights movement, they will even say that this mobilization ac across the globe is even different than that movement, just in terms of the scale. So mm -hmm. I think that Joe Biden should have whomever by his, his side, he believes can help him lead our country through this. Is there anyone that you would suggest for that job? If it were one of my puppies who could help him lead right now, um, I, I, I think he should, I think he should have whom, whomever he feels is best suited. All right. I'm getting the wrap. I'm, I'm going to send a couple questions your way before we, we sign off here. I want, I had some mom questions for you. And also I know your team wants to talk about the census. So with the kids, you know, we parents are trying to decide whether to send the kids back to school in person, virtually. I'm not sure if your kids' schools have made any decision on that. I know for my daughter's school, we can make that choice. So what's going on in, in your household as, as mom? So I know that um, the kids at my school are enrolled in are, are considering several options. And I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I have, all of my kids have uh, varying degrees of asthma, but one has severe asthma. And so just something I'll need to talk about um, with their pediatrician is if I send one or two, um, what that means for the other. Um, quite frankly, I, I think they would all go nuts if, they, if I sent one or two and didn't send them all. So the good may have to suffer with the bad on this, but I'm just gonna have to talk to their pediatrician about it. I have one who just graduated and is enrolled in college already. He absolutely hates virtual learning. So this has been a real big challenge for him, um, but his college is anticipating having in-person classes in the fall. So he's very excited about that. So just like so many parents, um, I'm trying to figure it out, but right now um, I've laughed and joked and said it's like I, I have bad neighbors. I feel like I live in an apartment again and with bad neighbors upstairs because my kids are up all night. In fact, my 12 year old is still up from yesterday. He hasn't been asleep yet. So we're all turned around in my house. That sounds like my 15 year old, almost 16 year old. She's still up when I leave the house. And that's like it's, uh, three in the morning, she's still up and I have to force her to go to sleep. Yes. But you know, it's not forever, right? Okay, so last question is on the census. The deadline to fill out the census is fast approaching. I guess any day now they could come knocking on our door and reminding us to fill, fill it out. Um, do you have any idea how Georgia is faring compared to the rest of the country? in terms of filling out the census and completing it? Well, we've been focused on Atlanta numbers. And so what I can say about Atlanta is that our numbers are a little higher than they were in 2010, but still not great. Okay. Um, I lead the US Conference of Mayors Subcommittee on the census. And so I'm talking to people across the country constantly um, about where their cities are. Everyone's lagging a little behind because we lost the opportunity to send people door to door. So we're just trying to reach people where they are um, with electronic reminders, robocalls, and it's so easy to fill out the census. You can either call a 1-800 number or you can go online and fill it out. And so we're just asking people to please do it because it's how we get money into our state and into our city. It's how we get money for our schools, our hospitals, our infrastructure, everybody wants better roads and it's how we get um representation in congress 
as well. It even determines how our council, city council district lines will be drawn. When I joined city council in 2010, um, we went through a redrawing of our district line. So it impacts us at every level. And I'm gonna show you something I have here. Um, this is a copy of the 1870 census. My grandmother's grandfather, a freed slave is listed on this census. His name was Shepherd Peak, mm -hmm. and he was from Crawfordsville, Georgia. This is his picture here. And so I am um, reminded of so many things during this time, just about the, the struggles and challenges um, that my ancestors overcame, but to see him reflected on the census seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation, I think really speaks to this responsibility that we all have. And when I see that he took the time to be a part of the census in the midst of all that was happening um, <clears throat> in his world, then certainly we can all take time to do the same. How important it was to be counted then and how it's important to be counted today. And then to have this historical record to see my ancestors reflect it. It's the same thing we'll leave for our children and their children's children. Mayor, you're so blessed to even have that that document. You know, a lot of us during this time we're we're digging back into our our family history a little bit and coming up empty. So you are blessed uh, of that. I I appreciate it more and more every day because most people don't have this. Um, most African Americans don't. And to even have his picture, which is pretty astonishing because I don't have a picture of my grandmother's father, but I have a picture of um, her grandparent. So I, I do consider myself blessed. Yeah. All right, Mayor, I appreciate your time. I wish I could hug you in person. And I wish in I person. Could. <laughs> <laughs> right before the unrest, things were getting a little, you know, a little easier in which I thought maybe I could see you in person for this interview, but I appreciate your time nevertheless. So nice to see you always.